Keith here. In this video I'm going to use a few Excel demo sheets to talk a little bit about analysis of variance. In this video I may cover material that I have done in other videos. If so, I hope it doesn't get too repetitive. To start with, I want to look at the problem of doing multiple t-tests to compare averages when we have more than two groups. So to start with, 166 is about the average height of Australian women with a standard deviation of 7. And I'm using those values to generate 10 samples of 10 women. So each column here is a sample and in each you can see there's 10 numbers representing the heights of 10 women. The next two rows are the means and standard deviations so you can get an idea of how well the simulated samples are matching up to the population. And you can see that's not too bad. All the averages are around about population mean of 166 some are a bit higher, some are a bit lower. Likewise the standard deviations, some are a bit higher than 7 and some are somewhat lower. But in general the samples are matching up to the population quite well. Now if you think about this situation, if I'm comparing the means of two samples here, I should accept the null hypothesis all the time. That's because all of the women are coming from the same population. So if there's a difference between samples, that's going to represent a type 1 error where I'm rejecting the null when I should accept it. So if I scroll down, what I've done here is a unpaired t-test for all possible comparisons of those 10 samples. Now what you see showing the right in the table here is the outcomes. If I scroll further down, here are the actual p-values associated with the test. So you can see in here for the comparison of sample 2 and sample 8, the p-value is coming 0.02. That's less than 0 0.05, so I mark that red. That's a statistically significant difference. But it also represents a type 1 error. Why? Because sample 2 and sample 8 are drawn from exactly the same population. It happens, if I scroll up and look at the averages, that uh, sample 8 here has a mean of 165, sample 2 here has an unusually high mean, so it's by chance gotten rather taller women. Now if we just focus on the, the outcomes of the test, all of them but one come up as N and S, not significant, so we're accepting the null hypothesis. And as I've just said, in the case of samples 2 and 8, we reject the null hypothesis, but that really represents a type 1 error. Now you can see there's a lot of tests. If you've got three means, then you just have three t-tests. Mean number 1 versus 2, 2 versus 3, and 1 versus 3. If you've got four groups, you can draw this on a piece of paper, you find you'll have six tests and by the time we get to 10 groups here we've got a total of 45 tests. So that's 45 chances to make a type 1 error. So now if I press F9 on... Okay, for some reason this keyboard is acting a bit funny. I've got to go Shift F9 and it's still going a bit funny. So every time I do Shift F9, it's generating a new set of numbers. Now you can see in this case, we've come up with quite a lot more than just one significant difference. There's 2, 3, 4, 10, 11 type 1 errors in that set of tests. Sometimes none, but type 1 errors are not uncommon. So this is why it's a bad idea to do multiple t-tests when comparing the averages of 
three or more groups. We're increasing the type, chance of a type 1 error. Now with only three groups, the chance of a type 1 error is only slightly higher than 5%. Hence once we go past three groups to four and five and six, then it starts to become a problem. Okay, now, uh, let's have a look at one factor analysis of variance. And the scenario here is uh, one I've taken from the CD and one I use a few times. And it's looking at this experiment that was done looking at the Waratah sea anemone. And the anemone does not occur lower down on the shore. Uh, this animal is common around on rocky shores around the southern part of Australia. And the study I'm talking about here was done near Sydney. Um, in fact, uh, right near Botany Bay. Um, so the anemone doesn't occur low down on the shore, so an experiment was done to try and find out whether it was to do with algae, which commonly inhabits the rock there. These are old photographs that are very fuzzy. So there's two types of algae common. Macroalgae, which are the large fleshy algae, which you can see here on the rock. And microalgae, this is mostly diatoms and blue-green bacteria. Um, and it occurs as a thin film over the rock. It's not really visible except as colouring to the naked eye. So the experiment had three uh, treatments. Uh, you can see an example down here, though this is actually taken from a different experiment. One was just transplanting the anemones into areas where there was macroalgae. Uh, and these animals can be removed from the rock if you do so carefully and put down somewhere else and they will stick. They are not permanently glued to the rock. I'm having trouble with my microphone and keeps slipping down. I'm sorry about that. Uh, putting them on areas where there was no macroalgae, but there was microalgae, so, and that could be seen by the coloration of the rock, and then putting them down in areas that were completely scrubbed bare of anything, and then go back after a while and look for results. So um, up here, you can see the actual numbers. So for the plus macroalgae, after a period of time, out of 15, 1, 4 and 5 remained in the three replicates. For the plus microalgae, 13, 7, 15 and then 15, 9 and 12 for the no algae. And there you can see the means calculated there in green and the variances. Now, analysis of variance assumes that the variances of the different groups are similar. And I haven't done the Cochrane's test here, or done residual plots, but for this set of data it is okay, um, even though they look rather variable. Uh, the analysis of various table is down here, and the number we're most interested in is the F value here, 7.08, which is obtained by dividing mean square among by mean square within. If we compare that to the table value, or the value from the F table, with 2 and 6 degrees of freedom, we'll find that it's a little bit bigger. So we reject the null hypothesis that the means of all groups are similar. And looking at the results, plus microalgae and no algae seem to be similar, with the plus macroalgae being smaller. The p-value associated with that F value is 0 0.03, so another way of testing the null is is the p-value less than 0 0.05? It is, so again, we reject the not. The two tables up here are showing the calculations in terms of the definitional formula. Now, when you're doing the calculations, you do intermediate calculations to get S1, S2 and S3. The formula you're using there are ones that are easy to use on a calculator, but they don't actually define the analysis of variance. The formulae I've got shown on this page here are the definitional formulae. So if we look at total sum of squares down here, 206, it is sum of, sum of, or sum of, sum of, 
xij minus x bar dot dot. So xij is just stands for an observation. x bar dot dot stands for the grand mean, which is uh, calculated up here as 9. So what this is formally saying here is for observation 1 in group 1, take away the grand mean, square that, and then add up for all observations in a group and or for all groups. So if we go over here, you'll see that the formula is D3, so the value up here for macroalgae sample 1, take away the grand mean squared. And so what I'm doing in this table is every observation, sorry, every observation up here take away the grand mean and square those values. And so if I add those values up for the groups I get the numbers there and if I add them up for all of the observations I get 206, the total sum of squares, which is what I worked out is earlier using the S terms. So total sum of squares is really just every observation, take away the grand mean, square that and add it up for all the data. The reason we square it is to make all the numbers positive. If we didn't, it would not matter what the data were, sum of squares total would always come out to be zero. Okay, then within groups, is calculated by taking the observation minus the mean for the group, squaring that up and doing that for each group. So over here, this is again observation 1 for macroalgae, take away the mean for the group here, 3.33, and square that, and do that for observation 2 and 3, and then add those up to get within sum of squares and it's within because every observation is compared just to the mean of that group. And if we do that for all groups and add it up, we get 6133, what I've calculated earlier as the sum of squares within. Now I haven't got a table showing the results. Oh yes I have, up here, the among sum of squares. Don't know my own spreadsheet, so well I haven't looked at this one for a while. Um, what we do here is take the mean for the group, subtract the grand mean, 9, and square that value. So that gives us an among sum of squares there, 32, 1, 1 for group 1, 7, 11 for group 2, and 9 for group 3. The large among for the first group there is an indication that it is the one that is different from the others. Then we add those up. Now that number 4822 is not the same one down here. We've got to multiply by n. That's because sum of squares total and sum of squares within are based on all of the observations. So in other words, there, there are nine calculations going on. There are nine things that are added up, or squared and added up. But when we do sum of squares among, it's only three because there's only three groups. So I've got to take into account the fact that those numbers are coming from three replicates in each group, so I multiply by n. So that's where the sum of squares come from, and that's how analysis experience is defined. We take the total variation and divide it into two bits, the bit with is completely within groups and the bit that is among groups. And the within groups makes clear sense. Up here I've calculated the variances and if I calculate the average variance I get 10.22 which is mean square among. So mean square among in the analysis of variance is just the average of the variances for the different groups. Okay, now the last thing we do is divide mean square among by mean square within and that is for this reason. If we go over here, mean square among as I've shown you 
is just the average variance over the groups. If we go through working with the formulae, we can show, and I'm not going to do it because I can't remember how, I haven't done it for a while, we can show that the mean square among consists of two numbers added together. It is an estimate of mean square within plus n times the sum of the treatment effects. So if the sum of the treatment effects is zero, if this number does not exist, mean square among is just another estimate of within group variance. So dividing mean square among by mean square within should give us one. That is if there's no treatment effects. So to demonstrate that, this is a modified form of the multiple t-test spreadsheet. What I've done is knock off, as you can see, six of the samples to make it simpler. I wonder if I'm going to have the problem with F9 here. And then over the side here I've done the calculations that are required to get the analysis of variance table and F value. And you can see I've also got the P value. So I'm doing some of the observations within the group. Um, so 1636 there is the sum of these. And then add that up for all the groups. Sum of the squares. Um, and the next values down here is the sum x for the group squared divided by 10. And using those I can get S1, 2 and 3 and work out the analysis of variance table. And then I've left in the t-test down here. And is Shift F9 going to work? It is. Okay. If you watch F as I do this, you'll see F jumps around above and below 1. But here's an example where the t-test is giving us a type 1 error, saying there's a difference between sample 1 and sample 4, but the analysis of it is giving us the correct outcome. p-value is 0.241, greater than 0 0.05, accept the null hypothesis. And you can see that F is around about 1 again. And F just jumps up and down. Again, a type 1 error in the t-test. Again, the analysis of variance is good. Now, two type 1 errors for the t-test. Um, and the analysis of variance is still good. Now, that doesn't mean the analysis will always give the correct result. Occasionally, the analysis of variance will give a type 1 error, as it is doing here, because we're getting some unusual samples coming up. And this is mostly sample number 4 here, which is coming in considerably below the population value. And so we get a difference between um, 1 and 2, but 1 and 4 and 3 and 4. So the type, the analysis variance is not immune to type 1 errors, but they will happen just 5% of the time the null is true. But as you can see, the t-test is giving a lot more type 1 errors. OK, I've got one more here. This one. So far I've been looking just in terms of one-factor analyses. And everything that applies to one factor also applies to two-factor analyses. But now we add in, in many two-factor designs, not all, in many, an interactive effect. Now. The graph here is showing the means, and the situation here is I'm looking at two sites um, and looking at control and impact values at both sites. Um, and what I want, to, and it doesn't matter what the sample variance and sample size are. I'm just dialing in numbers. Now, what we can do is start to look at what happens if there's a difference between sites or if there's an impact. So I'll start with an impact and I can dial in increasing degrees of impact like that. So all that's happening here is the control site staying where it is but the impact site, uh, the impact locations are dropping for both sites. At this point the p-value is 0.138 so there is not a statistically significant difference yet. The error bars are overlapping. You can see the graphs down here are showing at 
averages for control impact and site 1 versus site 2. When we get down to there, there's a big enough difference for the analysis that we actually be able to pick up and say that's an impact. Now let's go back here and we can do the same thing with sites. So you can see what happened here. Site 1 is dropping down uh, and Site 2 is increasing. Oh no, Site 1 is staying the same. Uh, site 2 is increasing and so that shows up as a difference over here and we get a significant difference here uh, for the site factor and we can have both. There. Now I have statistically significant differences between control and impact and site 1 and site 2. Now there's no interaction. The lines are parallel here and that means these summary graphs over here tell us exactly what's going on. Site 1 is lower than site 2. Well yep, if we go across control and impact and impact is lower than control. Uh, that's both impacts are lower than both controls. What happens when we dial in some interaction? Now things get more complicated. There. There we go. Now we're getting a difference between sites and a site by impact interaction. Impact and site interact. Um, but there's no impact. How can that be? Look over here. Control versus impact, they're exactly the same. There's still a site effect because site 1 values are still lower than site 2. But now because the lines are crossing, they're not parallel, the higher value for the impact at site 2 is cancelling out the lower value at site 1. So overall they show up as the same. So the interaction says something complicated is going on. And so when there's an interaction, I can't just look at the summary, control impact, site 1, site 2. I've got to go in here and look at the actual means for every site and for control and impact. Now this type of graph, if you draw it in a statistical package, is often called an interaction plot because it shows the interactions between the factors. Now, lastly, um, let's we can have a case where there are effects of impact, site, and an interactive effect. So again, the graphs over here, the summary graphs may be misleading and we've got to go to the interaction plot which will tell us there's an effect of control versus impact but only at site 2, not at site 1. Um, and finally, yep, I will leave it there. That's just about 25 minutes and that's long enough. So hopefully that explains a few more things about how analysis variance works.